WCW NWO Great American Bash 98 took place on June 14th in Baltimore, Maryland. Just under 13,000 fans attended the event. An estimated 262,000 fans bought the show on pay-per-view, and fans were going to see a few matches that were built up very well on TV over the past month or so. The Best of Seven series ends tonight when Booker T faces Chris Benoit, Sting and the Giant are going to clash over the ownership of the WCW Tag Team titles, and we've got the Tag Team match from Hell when Randy Savage teams up with Roddy Piper to take on Hollywood Hogan and Bret Hart. Let's check out the 1998 Great American Bash and we'll find out if it was any good. On Nitro, it was announced that the TV title Best of Seven series would end at the Great American Bash. Two matches would take place, Booker T vs Chris Benoit in the series final, and the winner of that match would face Fit Finley for the TV title later in the show. Match 7 got moved to Thunder instead, but in the Thunder match, Bret Hart got involved and he hit Booker T with a steel chair. Why did Bret do this, you may ask? Well, being NW Hollywood's main recruiter, Bret was trying to get Benoit to join the black and white. Chris Benoit wouldn't accept a cheap victory, so he told the referee what happened and Booker T won the Best of Seven series. However, later in the evening, Booker T announced that he didn't want to accept the victory that way. So JJ Dillon reverted back to the original plan and Match 7 had been rebooked for the Great American Bash. Whoever wins this one is the true winner of the Best of Seven series and the winner gets his shot at the belt a little later on. The TV title series has been excellent, but all good things must come to an end. Neither man takes control at the opening bell with both competitors performing takedowns. Booker takes a timeout following a drop toe hold, but back in the ring he brings it down with an arm bar. Booker then breaks a hammerlock by elbowing Benoit in the face. He then stays in control with a body slam and he gets a boot up when Benoit launches him in the corner. But then Chris performs a dragon screw. Keep in mind Booker's right knee had been causing him some problems. Benoit hits Booker hard with a few chops and he follows this up with a back elbow and a back suplex. The crippler then applies the best move of the whole pay per view, a chin lock, and when the two get to their feet Booker takes another hard chop. Even our main man Mark Curtis felt that one. Booker takes a snap suplex and the crowd pops when he counters a back suplex with a crossbody, but Benoit stays on Booker and we see chin lock number two. Risky business. Benoit takes a front suplex on the top rope and a forearm shot knocks him out of the ring. Benoit seems happy to take a count out victory, but Booker makes it back in and the TV champ takes a hook clothesline. Chris Benoit locks in chin lock number three, so that's a. Uh Been a while since we have done that, eh? Booker gets his arm stretched out while Benoit drives his head into Booker's back, but Booker gets up and he puts Benoit on the mat with a power slam. I talked about how well Booker and Benoit knew each other by this point in the series over on Reliving the War, and that comes into play when Benoit dodges a top rope forearm from Booker. This was a movie pulled out in match 6, and it's good how, in every match, the competitors remembered each other's high spots and how to avoid them. Case in point, Booker's able to get to the ropes really fast after Benoit traps the arm. He knew the crossface was up next and he realized it way quicker than others. My god, chin lock number 4, Benoit's trying to break the record tonight it seems. This time Booker gets out and he performs an enziguri followed by his signature spine buster. Booker then performs a flopjack, but Benoit counters a hangover attempt with a big old superplex that makes the crowd go crazy. Benoit performs his German suplexes. He only manages to perform two, but he fights off Booker's counter attempt and he finishes the trifecta with a dragon suplex. The crowd rise to their feet, but Booker kicks out at two. The diving headbutt connects when Benoit pulls off his signature aerial attack, but just like match two, Benoit's unable to cover his opponent immediately after the move. So Booker kicks out, he sends Benoit to the corner, he lands two Hardham side kicks, one to the back and one to the front, and the best of seven series ends with a missile drop kick from Booker T. Booker wins the whole series and he's gonna face Fit Finley later on in the show. Excellent stuff. Tony Schiavone says we witnessed eight of the finest matches in WCW history and honestly I'd agree. But as mentioned previously, make sure you check out their matches just before the series too. There's around 13 or 14 in total recorded for TV during 1998. Saturn takes on Chris Canyon next. The match was originally supposed to be Raven vs Canyon, but Raven's such a good friend that he let Perry take his place instead. Saturn wasn't very pleased about having to do Raven's dirty work, but let's see if he was victorious. Canyon comes out in his mortis gear and the commentators are a little confused. 
Turns out that's not really Canyon though. Chris was waiting behind Saturn the whole time and he tries to steal a victory right away but Perry kicks out. Canyon pulls off a smooth neckbreaker next, he pummels Saturn in the corner before getting Perry up for an electric chair face buster, and Chris then has to take out Smackhead Kidman who just showed up along with Lodi. Finally, Saturn's able to do something after getting clotheslined out of the ring. He trips Chris up and he performs a vaulting splash from the apron, but Kenyon turns it around immediately after Saturn runs into the ring post shoulder first. Chris pulls off a top rope famouser, but he then gets attacked by the flock when Lodi distracts Nick Patrick. Patrick realizes what's going on, he sends the flock back up the ramp, but the attack allows Saturn to take control on the outside. Saturn brings Kenyon back in with a suplex, he delivers a drop toe hold followed by an ankle lock, Kenyon gets his wee mortis smashed on the top rope, and it goes to the outside again when Saturn hits a springboard clothesline. Saturn brings a chair into the ring, he uses it to launch himself into Kenyon, he then summons his inner Sabu by pulling off a moonsault while using the chair as a springboard, and even after all this, Kenyon's able to come back with a Russian leg sweep that slows Saturn down momentarily. A vaulting elbow drop from the apron back into the ring misses though, and Saturn takes this opportunity to apply a chin lock. It's gonna be one of those pay per views, isn't it? Saturn pulls off the same crossbody counter spot as Booker T. Kenyon tries again and he lands the back suplex this time. There's a lot of back and forth action next, with Saturn failing to lock in the rings of Saturn and Kenyon pulling off a fireman's carry into a flopjack. We then see a fireman's carry neckbreaker from the innovative Chris Kenyon, but Saturn's able to eventually stop Chris with a super kick after Kenyon dodged the death volley driver attempt. Both men fall out of the ring when Perry goes for a top rope move, and then two mortises show up. The crowd's a little confused when the two mortises begin fighting with each other both in the ring and outside the ring. Saturn isn't too sure what to make of this either, but Kenyon takes advantage and he hits a reverse Russian leg sweep. This move would get renamed as as the flatliner, but as you guys know who watch Reliving the War, Kenyon's original flatliner was a second rope Samoan drop. The dominant Mortis raises Kenyon's hand before hitting him with a DDT. It's Raven dressed as Mortis. Raven gets in the ring and he says all Saturn had to do was beat Kenyon. It was a simple assignment and Saturn didn't get the job done. Saturn then goes to attack Raven, but the flock end up jumping him. Fortunately, Saturn's able to beat the flock up with super kicks and suplexes, but now it appears that Saturn's definitely left the faction and we'll need to check out Nitro to see what's next for Perry and the flock. Not a terrible match here, the action in the ring was good, but the crowd didn't care much for the Mortis appearances, they weren't sure what to make of it. On Thunder this past week, Dean Malenko gave up the cruiserweight belt, but this was only done so Malenko could get Chris Jericho in the ring at the Great American Bash. Jericho thought James J. Bebe Dillon was going to hand the title back over to Chris, but Dillon said the only way the belt goes back to Jericho is if he can beat Dean Malenko at the pay-per-view. Malenko's tired hearing about this conspiracy nonsense, so he's going into the Great American Bash to prove a point. He knows that Jericho wants the belt, yet he's afraid to win it fair and square. And keep in mind too though, this also means that the title will remain vacant if there's a DQ or countout finish. The match begins with both men running into each other with a double clothesline, but Jericho gets the upper hand with a jumping back kick. Dean replies with a German suplex and Chris takes a kick in, in the corner. Dean keeps the pressure on, the commentators mention how Dean's a lot more aggressive tonight, but he loses focus when Chris gets a boot up in the corner and when Jericho starts shadow boxing with the referee following a shoulder block. Malenko does manage to counter a land tamer attempt though and Jericho takes a suplex. The Iceman brings it down to the mat with a double handed deadly chin lock and when the two men get back to their feet, Chris takes an awful looking ring post bump when getting sent into the corner. This didn't look good at all. Dean's unable to capitalize so Jericho pulls off a plancha before the match gets back in the ring. The Ayatollah then pulls off a textbook suplex before embarrassing Dean with a one foot pin attempt. Dean then finds himself in a sleeper hold and when he counters it with a sleeper of his own, Chris hits a back suplex. Jericho then delivers a body slam but his follow up land salt misses because he was wasting way too much time. 
Dean wakes up, he performs his jumping leg lariat. We see this top rope move where Dean smashes Chris's face on the mat, but Jericho stays in it when he counters the super gut buster with a top rope hurricane rana. Dean then counters a power bomb with a teabag drop, and Billy Silverman rightly doesn't acknowledge the cover because Chris's shoulders are off the mat. Dean tells the ref to begin counting anyway, though, so Silverman does it. Jericho reverses, and we see the lion tamer. In Dean's struggle to reach the bottom rope is both hilarious and absolutely awesome, thanks to the crowd going crazy during Jericho's finishing move. Jericho thinks he's won the match, and he's about to punch Silverman when he learns the match is gonna continue. He goes back to Dean, and he manages to pull off an Alabama slam. A few mod counters result in Dean struggling to lock in the cloverleaf, but Malenko ends up locking it in, and this time it's Jericho who makes it to the ropes. This one's really picked up over the last few minutes. The crowd's still going crazy as Chris pulls off a double underhook backbreaker. Chris then destroys Malenko in the corner, but he makes a big mistake when he says, you're nothing just like your dead father. Dean explodes out of the corner and he assaults Chris with right hands, and the two end up on the outside where Dean continues to lose it. Malenko grabs a chair, he hits Jericho across the back, and the referee calls for the bell. It's a DQ finish, so no one wins the championship. Dean continues to beat Jericho up on the entranceway, they fight at the entrance stage where Billy Silverman gets taken out, and we follow Chris and Dean all the way through the arena corridors and out of the streets. Chris gets thrown into a mailbox before he dashes across the road. He has to stop traffic so he can escape into a random building while Doug Dillinger tries to calm Dean down. And back in the arena, the crowd boos when Dave Penzer announces that Chris Jericho just won the match via disqualification. A good and fun match here. I was slightly losing interest after the opening moments, but it picked right back up and it turned out pretty well. Back at the WCWWrestling.com table, Eddie Guerrero's getting interviewed and he really, really doesn't want to fight his crazy nephew Chavo tonight. He begs for Chavo to reconsider, but there's no way out for Uncle Eddie tonight. Eddie made his nephew into this unhinged monster, and now Eddie has to deal with the consequences. WCW then aired a Juventud Guerrera hype video before his match with Big Reese's peanut butter filled easter egg, and I've often wondered if Hoovy would have still got this push if Rey Mysterio wasn't out with an injury. It's almost like he's been slotted into that underdog role that Mysterio was in before getting benched with an injury. Big Reese almost falls over as soon as he enters the arena, and here we go. Hoovy vs Reese, classic David vs Goliath shenanigans at the Great American Bash. Hoovy cries in the corner because he knows this match is gonna suck. Reese misses a lariat, but he captures Hoovy in a knuckle lock before throwing Hoovy into the corner. Guerrero tries to come back with punches, but he keeps getting shoved away. Hoovy then decides to run away and cry some more when he realizes he just can't hurt this giant peanut butter cup. Reese follows Hoovy. Hoovy gets back in the ring. He tries a springboard plancha, but he gets caught in midair. A ring post bump gets followed up with Reese throwing Hoovy back in the ring. Guerrero lands on his feet. Reese gets back in the ring, and Hoovy's attempts at attacking the knees completely fail. Reese holds Guerrero by the head while Guerrero swings a few punches. An absolute classic. A kick stuns Reese, though, and this allows Hoovy to jump on Reese's back. Hoovy chokes the big man, he scratches his face. Reese goes down to one knee, but he gets himself up and he rams Juventud into the turnbuckles. The crowd's pretty flat here and you can't blame them either really. It continues on with a backbreaker submission from the Yeti. Hoovy finds himself in a bear hug, and his answer to all this is to kick Reese right in the peanuts, twice in front of the referee. Reese drops down to his knees to clothesline Hooventude, and man, I'm glad this one's near over. Reese performs a vertical suplex. Hoovy has to use Charge Robinson to get back to his feet. Reese then goes out and he grabs a steel chair, but he's unable to use it, seeing as Robinson grabs it away mid swing. Van Hummer then does a terrible job of keeping himself hidden as Hoovy goes to the top rope. Hoovy jumps, he sits on Reese's shoulders, Van Hammer hits Reese with that steel chair, and we see a hurricane rana from Hoovy. It's about as good as it could have been, really. Hoovy covers Reese, and Guerrero wins via pinfall. Thank God that's over. Eddie Guerrero vs Chavo Guerrero is our next match, and I've been looking forward to this one. Eddie's been treating his nephew very poorly over the past few months, and Chavo ended up snapping in the most unhinged way possible. 
Not only has he conformed to Eddie's demands, but he's taken it a few hundred steps further by inviting his uncle to hit him. He's been happy to replace Eddie in Eddie's matches. He's tried to attack his uncle on more than one occasion. In short, he's lost the ability to think straight due to the trauma he's experienced being Eddie's little servant. Eddie gets in the ring and he offers Chavo a handshake. This version of Chavito is way more than what Eddie bargained for and he wants out of the match ASAP. But Chavo's not interested. When Chavo smacks Eddie across the face though, Eddie seems to wake up a little and he remembers the pecking order in the Guerrero family. Eddie asks Chavo if he really wants a piece of Uncle Eddie, and when Chavo says yes, he ends up taking a few hard chops and a few punches. Eddie screams, don't mess with Uncle Eddie, and Chavo turns it around by hitting a few chops of his own. Chavo performs a huge back body drop, the two then roll out of the mat while punching each other, and the referee has to get in between the Guerreros when they both end up in the corner. Chavo runs at Eddie and he ends up getting dropped on the top turnbuckle pad and ring post. The same thing happens to Eddie, only Eddie gets messed up when he lands on that turnbuckle. The skin is rubbed from Eddie's shoulder. Chavo hits Eddie on the pads and you can see here that Eddie's shoulder is already getting worse. He tries his tilt award backbreaker but it gets countered with a head scissor takedown. And then Eddie decides to leave, he's had enough. Chavo follows Uncle Eddie out to the entranceway and he throws him back in the ring, giving Eddie a chance to kick the middle rope and smash Chavo's nuts into a million tiny pieces. Eddie performs a back suplex, he plays up to the audience before wrenching down on Chavo's arm. Chavo counters with an arm drag and a monkey flip, and Chavo then goes for an aerial attack. He lands on his feet after performing a somersault and he then lands a moonsault on the opposite side of the ring. It spills to the outside where Eddie regains control by throwing his nephew into the ring steps. He then delivers a brain buster back inside the ropes and Chavo grabs Eddie by the throat when Eddie talks a little trash. Eddie's reaction is absolutely brilliant here. Chavo chokes Eddie and the referee has to step in to break things up. Eddie escapes to the outside and Chavo gives chase. They go round and round the ring a few times and Eddie ends up hiding behind Mickey J when the two get back inside. Eddie sees an opportunity to take out Chavo and he aims for the leg and knee. Eddie then locks in a figure four and he then applies the gory special when the two get back to their feet. Chavo again tries his arm drag and drop kick counter but Eddie sees the drop kick coming and Eddie's gonna stay in the driver's seat for a little while longer. By the way, I'm absolutely loving this match so far. The crowd aren't very hot for it but I think it's been fantastic. We see a camel clutch from Eddie Guerrero. The crowd chant boring and Goldberg and Eddie plays along with it. These Baltimore ball bags don't know what good wrestling is. Eddie then delivers an airplane spin but once again he finds himself on the outside. This allows Chavo to pull off a somersault plancha over the top rope. The fans couldn't care less. They chant we want flair as these two continue to work their asses off and yeah, it's not good. Chavo performs a springboard bulldog. Eddie stops a Chavo aerial attack but Chavo moves out of the way when Eddie goes for the frog splash. Eddie counters the tornado DDT by throwing Chavo to the outside. Chavo comes back in with a springboard tornado DDT and that's it over. Chavo Guerrero defeats Uncle Eddie at the Great American. American Bosch. A brilliant match, I really enjoyed this one. The fans in the arena definitely didn't agree with me on this one, but make sure you go back and watch it from start to end. One of the most underrated matches of 1998 for sure. Booker T comes out to the arena for his TV title shot. It's not the first time Booker's performed twice at a pay-per-view, but at least this time it wasn't back-to-back -back matches. I'll just say it straight out the gate, the Benoit vs Booker match was better. I'm not sure if the plan here was to keep this one as grounded as possible, seeing as Booker already wrestled, but Finley was determined to keep it on the mat it seemed. It started with Booker hitting his hook kick, so it started well. But the holds began when Booker missed an enziguri. The two get up and Booker lands his running forearm, he then performs a jumping shoulder tackle from the ring to the outside, he misses an axe kick and Finley slams Booker down for a half Boston Crab followed by a leg lock. Granted, Booker went into this one with a kayfabe knee injury, so do keep that in mind, I'm maybe being a bit too picky here. Finley drives his knee into Booker's knee while pulling at the challenger's ankle. Any submission move targeted at the knee, Finley pulls it off. Booker pulls off the sunset flip that defeated Chris Benoit in match 6 of the TV title series, but Finley kicks out before going right back to submission holds. Finley wraps Booker's leg around his neck while applying pressure to the challenger's neck. 
Booker fights out and he lays the punches in, but his side headlock gets countered with a knee breaker and it's right back to the mat. The crowd have completely lost interest as expected, so Finley tries another approach. He throws Booker to the outside, he picks up a chair, Mark Curtis tells Finley to put it down and Finley complies. He instead wraps Booker's leg around the ring post and he tries to get a count out victory, but Booker makes it back into the ring. Finley pulls off a Vader bomb, but the audience are singing goodbye at a fan who must have got ejected from the arena. Even Finley gets distracted by the singing and it's really off-putting when trying to watch the match at home. This one's been a bit of a disaster and I'm not sure if it's because Booker vs Benoit was so good, you know? As the boring chants start, Booker hits a spinning back kick and the crowd pipe down. Booker hits a power slam followed by an axe kick. He shows off his spin rooney and then he performs an air spin rooney when Finley clotheslines him. Inside out bumps look great, but I think that was maybe the wrong time to pull one off. Booker tries to counter a tombstone, but he drops Finley. He drops him one more time when trying to get back to his feet. I put this down to wrestling two matches, and I also think they messed up the finish here because Booker ends up winning the TV title with a reverse tombstone, so yeah, they blew the last spot in the match. Booker becomes TV champion, and this bout really does highlight how good Booker and Benoit work together. You kind of feel bad for Booker here because the build up of this match was absolute top tier legendary stuff, and then, well, this TV title match happens in front of a very harsh audience. Stevie Ray comes down to celebrate with his little brother, and Booker leaves the Baltimore Arena as the new WCW TV champion. Conan steps in for Kurt Hennig next to face Bill Goldberg. Hennig said he wasn't cleared to wrestle, so Conan promised to bring the US title to the Wolfpack tonight at the Bash. Hennig and Rick Rude come to the ring with Conan, Goldberg gets a thunderous pop on his way to the ring. The commentators say if Goldberg wins this one, the streak will reach 100 victories, so let's see what happened. Conan gets shoved to the mat right away and he takes a timeout. His Wolfpack buddies tell him to get back in and get the job done, so Conan gets it together and he ends up in a pretty tense side headlock. Conan slips out and he goes for a hammerlock and… oh, that's a bit rough isn't it? I like the part where Conan was on his neck with his legs in the air. Quality. Conan gets angry and he lays in a ton of strikes, Goldberg throws him to the corner, Conan gets the feet up, Billy Boy shakes it off and Conan walks straight into a spear. That's it over, Goldberg hits the jackhammer and it's announced that Goldberg is now 100 and 0. By the reliving the war count though, that is incorrect. This is gonna blow your mind and I had to triple check it but it's correct. After the Nitro match last week, Goldberg wrestled again. He defeated Conan in Auburn Hills after beating Chavo earlier in the evening. He then defeated Raven the next night during the Saturday night tapings, though the match didn't air. On Thunder, Goldberg defeated Conan in a dark match, and then the next night he defeated Conan again at a house show in Erie, Pennsylvania. On the 13th of June, Goldberg wrestled twice at the AJ Palumbo Center in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He defeated Sting in 59 seconds, and then he defeated Conan in 46 seconds. I know, it's crazy. And then he defeats Conan again here at the Great American Bash. Goldberg is not at 100 wins, he's really at 102 wins. His 100th victory was actually against Sting, according to our week by week streak counter. After the bout, we think Hennig and Root are going to help Conan to the back, but they end up attacking him. In the middle of the beatdown, Hennig takes off his Wolfpack shirt and he's wearing a black and white shirt underneath. Nash and Luger run down to help Conan, but Kurt and Root get out of the ring, and there you have it. Kurt Hennig and Rick Root have jumped back to the black and white NWO after about, what, three or four weeks? Makes you wonder why they bothered joining the Wolfpack at all. The first of two main event matches take place next, billed as the tag team match from hell. It's Bret Hart and Hollywood Hogan vs Roddy Piper and Randy Savage. Bret cost Randy the world belt the night after Spring Stampede. He then defeated Macho at Slambury while Roddy Piper officiated the match, but due to the hitman cheating, Piper reversed the decision the next night on Nitro. Since then, Bret has played Piper and Savage against each other and it's worked very well. Hollywood Hogan got involved and he suggested a tag team match at the Great American Bash against Savage and the Hot Rod, and the babyfaces ended up agreeing to the match. 
Thanks to Brett getting in Savage's head, the Macho Man said he wanted to fight Piper immediately following the tag team match, and Piper reluctantly agreed. These two haven't been getting on too well at all, so this should be a pretty easy victory for Hogan and Hart tonight at the Great American Bash. To add a little extra something to this match, Miss Elizabeth left Savage and she sided with NW Hollywood. Savage said he doesn't really care, but there's also a chance he's not being fully honest. Miss Elizabeth, though, is not at the Great American Bash. Don't let the fact that Hollywood Hogan and Bret Hart are actually teaming up tonight for a pay-per-view match escape you either. This is quite the team ride here, but understandably, the circumstances around such a monumental pairing isn't ideal. Piper and Savage is also a very, very noteworthy team, so the star power we have in this match is off the charts, even if a few guys are a little past their prime. Here's the thing though, you know how the audience completely hated the Eddie and Chavo match? Well, they absolutely lose their minds when the action begins in the ring. Hogan getting his eyes poked gets a bigger pop than anything that's happened all night, so you gotta respect that these four guys were still getting fans excited. You might be big into work rate wrestlers and you might despise these old school guys hogging the spotlight, but a lot of fans still enjoyed these guys in main event matches. It's undeniable when you watch this show back. Quick tags lead to Piper and Savage keeping Hogan away from the hitman. Hogan takes two inverted atomic drops from Piper, the hot rod bites Hogan's forehead, the Hulkster gets super comboed in the corner and Savage comes in briefly to rake Hogan in the eyes. When Piper comes back in, the NWO booty man smacks him with the word belt from the outside and this allows Brett to tag in and Brett works on keeping Piper away from the macho man. The Hot Rod takes a backbreaker followed by a boot in the midsection. Brett and Hogan work together before Hollywood tags back in. Hogan chokes Roddy on the top rope as the audience start chanting Hogan sucks. Hulk then scratches Piper's back and face and even the hitman gets in on the action. Savage is not helping matters by keeping the referee distracted. We see the hitman's Russian leg sweep and the elbow drop from Brett's rope. The hitman taunts Macho by dragging Piper around the ring and again the Macho Man doesn't help matters. He swears and spits at the hitman while Hogan chokes Piper and when Brett goes back to the hot rod you can see that Roddy's really blown up. He looks absolutely exhausted. Macho tags Piper while Roddy's in a small package but the referee doesn't see it. This leads to Brett and Hogan once again bringing Piper to the NWO corner and the hot rod takes another beating. Piper makes another tag while in a front face lock, Nick Patrick again doesn't see the tag, so Macho Man loses it and he grabs a chair. We see the best spot of the match when Macho slides the chair on top of Piper and the hitman headbutts it. This was perfectly timed too, it's so good. And finally, Savage gets tagged in and the crowd pops. Macho takes on both Brett and Hogan and he wipes both guys out. He makes the mistake of pinning Hogan while Brett's still in the ring, but Hogan then accidentally clotheslines the hitman and now the babyfaces have a chance. The heels get thrown into each other, Savage goes to elbow drop the hitman, but Piper hits the ropes and Savage falls down. Looks like Savage has hurt his knee. Hogan gets the chance to wrap Savage's knee around the ring post as the disciple deals with Piper, and when Piper turns his attention to Hogan, Brett's able to apply the sharpshooter. Macho Man gives it up, so Brett and Hogan win this tag team match. The match wasn't good, it's noteworthy for the talent involved and the crowd really got into it, but you'll only watch this one for the novelty of it. So Mean Gene Okerlund gets in the ring and he wonders how Piper and Savage are going to have this one on one match after the beating both men just took from Hart and Hogan. Piper clearly doesn't want to fight Savage, he even helps the Macho Man up to his feet, but Savage blindsides Piper and the bell rings to start this one on one match. Savage is in no shape to wrestle, he's favouring the knee big time as he chokes Piper out and he lays in a big right hand. Still, Macho goes up for the big elbow and he's able to hit his finisher but he can't cover Piper. He slowly gets up, Charles Robinson tries to talk some sense into Macho but he gets punched in the face for his troubles. It's a great bump by the way. Piper hits a low blow, a poke to the eye and a punch to the face. Roddy then applies a figure four, Mickey J runs down to the ring and Savage submits. The Macho Man gave up twice at one pay per view, the second time was in a match that he demanded. I know someone else who that probably wouldn't work for brother but Savage didn't care, so fair play to him. Randy's got one more match to go, it happens tomorrow night on Nitro and we won't see Savage compete on WCW Nitro again until April 1999. Randy had to get knee surgery, he was putting it off for a long time, and while we will see him again at the very end of 1998, it isn't until next year when he competes again inside the ring. The final match of the 1998 Great American Bash features Sting taking on the Giant. 
The Giant joined NWO Hollywood when he was booked to tag up with Sting to take on the Outsiders at Slamboree. Giant and Sting won the tag team titles when Scott Hall turned on Kevin Nash, and things got even more complicated when Sting decided to join NWO Wolfpack while still holding the tag belts with the big man. JJ Dillon decided to book this match tonight and the winner gets to control the tag team titles. Sting can pick a new tag team partner and champion if he wins the match, as can the Giant, so the stakes are high enough in this main event match, although it does feel a little odd to end the show with this bout. Jan comes to the ring smoking a cigarette, and this isn't as random as what the internet makes it out to be. Sting said on Nitro that Jan needed to get in shape and quit smoking, so Jan was just defying the stinger right here. Out comes the red and black Sting to a great reaction. Jan starts it off by blowing smoke in Sting's face, so Sting whacks the big man and Jan backs up. The giant then dashes in at Sting, but the icon moves out of the way and Jan takes a few kicks while stuck on the top ropes. We then see a great stinger splash while Jan's still stuck, but a second attempt results in Sting taking a big boot. Sting then gets stumped out of the ring, he takes a big chop when he gets back in. The stinger builds up a little momentum when running the ropes, but his crossbody has absolutely no effect at all. The giant drops a big elbow, and check this out, military press snake eyes from the giant. Sting got a lot of air on that one. The giant stands on Sting's neck before locking in a bear hug. Sting almost fades out, but he breaks the hole by biting the giant's forehead. That'll work. A low drop kick floors the big man, the stinger delivers two stinger splashes, and the crowd goes crazy when Sting body slams the giant. It's not enough to end the match though, Jan breaks a death lock attempt, Sting then delivers a death drop, but again the giant kicks out. Jan then goes for the choke slam, but he's unable to get Sting up. Not sure what happened here, but the commentators think his knee gave out. So Sting hits another scorpion death drop, and again the Jan kicks out. So it's going to have to be something special that ends this match. Sting gets the feed up when Jan runs at him in the corner. Sting then sets up a death drop from the top rope, and Sting's able to win the match after the third scorpion death drop. Sting now owns both tag team titles, and it sounds like Sting's going to choose his partner tomorrow night on Nitro. This match was definitely cut short due to other matches going too long, but I still thought it was alright. Now that I think about it, it was actually a good call putting this on after the tag team match, but it's just a shame it wasn't a bit longer. I enjoyed the 1998 Great American Bash, and although the usual suspects with the big money fall below expectations, there is still a lot of fun to be had here. Chavo vs Eddie was the match of the night for me, Booker vs Benoit was great as always, Jericho vs Malenko really picked up towards the end of the match, and the main event wasn't bad either. The tag match from hell is a match you can look at and just marvel that all four of these guys worked a match together, although the match itself wasn't all that great. And the lower points for me were Finley vs Booker and Reese vs Hoovy. That TV title match really fell apart and it's a real shame. I recommend the 1998 Great American Bash though, not the best pay per view of the year, but you can do way way worse. Join me next week for Reliving the War and we'll find out who Sting selects for his tag team partner, we'll hopefully find out where Jericho ended up after his match, and we'll see if there's any more defections within NW Hollywood and NW Wolfpack. Thanks for watching guys, I do appreciate it, and take care.